Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Bridget Conley. I'm the research director at the World Peace Foundation and an associate research professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. I'll be your moderator, and I want to tell you we have more than 200 people who registered to join us, and we are thrilled to see such interest. So today's program is an outgrowth of a multi-year collaboration between World Peace Foundation and Global Rights Compliance, who have led on recent activities. Together, our aim was to advance the prevention and prohibition of mass starvation and associated violations, including through legal accountability. So beginning in the 1990s, as many of you know, there's a revolution in political, public, and legal understanding and willingness to prosecute violations of international humanitarian law and the laws of war. But it did not treat all crimes equally. One area which was largely left behind were starvation crimes, various acts that intentionally produce conditions in which people are deprived of food and water, as well as other objects, um, activities uh, that are indispensable for life. Our project was launched in the wake of UN warnings in 2017 of new threats of famine and in the context of waning commitment to international law. Nonetheless, we sought to ask if we, working in concert with others, could prompt action to halt and prosecute starvation by reinvigorating discussions of its place in international law. Today's discussion continues this work. Our program will begin with a panel of experts. We have four speakers lined up who I'll introduce in a moment. And as you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A. Don't use the chat because we'll only be monitoring the Q&A for questions. And we'll reserve 20 minutes for discussion of your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. We're going to begin with Tom Dannenbaum, who is an associate professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And he's going to discuss the evolution of the law on starvation. Next will be Diane Mazarana, who's also from Tufts, where she's research professor at the Fletcher and Friedman schools and the research director at the Feinstein International Center. She will address linkages between starvation crimes and gender-based violence. Ali Jamil, the Accountability and Advocacy Director for Montana for Human Rights, will then share a case study of starvation crimes in Yemen. Following him, we'll have Alex Duvall, Executive Director of the World Peace Foundation and Research Professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts. Alex will discuss the use of starvation as a weapon of war and the recent conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region. And finally, we'll turn to Katrina Murdoch, who's a partner at Global Rights Compliance, and she will discuss the work of investigating and documenting starvation crimes. So let's get started. Tom, over to you. Thanks very much, Bridget. Uh, as Bridget indicated, this is an urgent issue, but also an issue to which the law has been slow to catch up. And there are enduring questions and challenges associated with the specific issue of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare. Before I get into those, let me just first deal with a key predicate question, which is when this body of law applies at all. What we're talking about is a war crime. What that means is a serious violation of international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict. And that's a body of international law that applies only in contexts either of international armed conflict, including belligerent occupation, which is to say conflict between two states with states at either end of the conflict dyad, or non-international armed conflict, which is to say intense armed violence between organized armed groups and states or among organized armed groups. And international humanitarian law applies in both of those two kinds of conflict, but the content of IHL applicable in those two contexts is not identical. And war crimes are a subset of international humanitarian law, serious violations of international humanitarian law, again applicable in both kinds of armed conflict, but again without identical substantive content across the two. And the upshot of something being a war crime is 
that it's not just that the parties to the conflict are bound by the rules, as is the case with all international humanitarian law rules, but also that individuals can be prosecuted, including before international or foreign courts, and including for official acts or acts undertaken pursuant to superior orders. So that's really what's at stake in criminalization specifically. International humanitarian law has generally in its history been permissive with respect to starvation methods in the conduct of hostilities, and that's largely because they were seen as militarily effective, and international humanitarian law has always sought to balance the issue of human protection with the question of facilitating or the objective of facilitating the capacity of the parties to fight. And this only really started to change, this posture started to change with respect to starvation in the 1970s with the negotiation and subsequent agreement of the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, which were agreed in 1977, and which prohibited starvation of civilians as a method of warfare in both international and non-international armed conflicts. And that was a controversial step, an essential step, but also a controversial one, precisely because it was seen by some states to impede their capacity to fight. And it's notable in that respect that it was not included in the list of grave breaches, which are the treaty-based war crimes under the additional Protocol 1 in that agreement in 1977. And what that means is that starvation of civilians was prohibited as it applied to states acting in conflict or organized armed groups acting in conflict, but it didn't underpin the capacity to prosecute individuals internationally or transnationally for perpetrating those acts of starvation. It took another 20 years until we saw a significant shift in that respect, and that was with the agreement of the ICC, the International Criminal Court Statute in 1998, which included in Article 82B25 the prohibition of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare as a war crime. And that was significant not just for what it meant for the authority of the International Criminal Court, but also because the ICC statute is a critical normative focal point for informing national war crimes codes and indeed the war crimes codes of other international and hybrid tribunals. So it has significant knock-on effect even beyond the International Criminal Court. But it also had a significant flaw which is that it was exclusive to international armed conflict, the more regulated but far less common form of armed conflict in the contemporary context. And that severely constrained the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction over this crime and indeed the jurisdictions of every war crimes forum that is based on the ICC code or is derived from the ICC code. And that flaw was not remedied for another two decades until the agreement in 2019 among states parties to the International Criminal Court system of an amendment to the statute to extend the starvation war crime to non-international armed conflicts. That too could be expected to have a significant knock-on effect in terms of informing national war crimes codes and the interpretation of residual categories in national war crimes codes, as well as subsequent or new international and hybrid tribunal statutes. But it also comes with a significant limitation, which is that the ICC statute amendments regime applies amendments only to those states parties that ratify the amendment specifically, so not to all ICC states parties. And right now, that's 11 states of the 123 states parties to the ICC. So the difference between non-international armed conflict jurisdiction at the ICC and international armed conflict jurisdiction on the specific issue of starvation of civilians is still dramatically disparate. Beyond the question of jurisdiction, there's also a question arising with respect to interpretation. One of the upshots of this relatively narrow jurisdiction is that we don't have case law at the international or transnational levels on starvation. And what that means is that it can be difficult to know exactly what the scope of the crime is, particularly with respect to open interpretive questions. The ICC elements of the crime defines the crime as the deprivation of indispensable objects with the intent to starve civilians as a method of warfare. The key question is, what exactly does intent mean? Is it limited to what is known as direct or purposive intent, or does it include oblique intent? In other words, acting with the knowledge that an outcome will occur, regardless of whether that outcome is one's purpose. And additionally, to what exactly does intent need to attach? Is it specifically the outcome of starvation of civilians, or might it also include the transitive process of starvation of civilians, in other words, the act of deprivation? 
The answers to those questions will be critical to understand the scope of the crime and will have material implications for the viability of legal accountability and the kinds of concrete cases to which we'll now turn. Just before we do, and in closing, let me note that in terms of thinking about where we might see the most productive global precedent that might resolve some of these legal ambiguities and lay the foundation for accountability efforts with respect to starvation more broadly, in my view, the most likely place for that to happen is Ukraine. Not because it's the situation that is most worthy of attention, I don't think it is at all, but instead because it has specific jurisdictional advantages and interpretive advantages in virtue of the fact that it is a clear international armed conflict within the scope of, international, of the International Criminal Court's authority and in which there's an open ICC investigation as well as investigations across multiple other states. So the key question will be how to make sure that efforts towards accountability in the context of Ukraine lay a productive precedent that actually bolsters efforts for accountability regarding salvation in other situations rather than detracting attention from them. So I'll leave it there and turn it back to Bridget. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We'll now to turn to Diane Mazarama. Thank you very much, Bridget. So today I'll be presenting findings from research conducted by myself, Bridget Conley, who's our moderator, and my colleague Kinsey Spears that links sex, gender, sexual and gender-based violence and starvation crimes. And I wanna make four key points. First, mass starvation and SGBV are mutually reinforcing atrocity crimes. For example, when females are intentionally separated for their young children for a duration of time for the purposes of perpetrating SGBV, including rape, forced marriage, sexual enslavement, this may constitute a starvation crime. Separation can significantly elevate risks for children's survival, especially in the context of ongoing mass starvation. For example, in South Sudan, Clemens Pinyao documented violent attacks that had destructive impacts on maternal care. During assaults on villages, the desperate flights to escape were often extremely difficult for pregnant women and mothers who fled with the youngest, especially nursing children. He documented instances of attacks that appeared to intentionally target pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. These included mothers who were separated from infants who were then left to die, and of belligerents who raped and killed mothers in front of their children and then gloated that without the mother's care and due to lack of food, water, and shelter, the children would not survive. Rape, as psychologist and psychotherapist Evelyn Jose finds, can significantly deteriorate a mother's ability to care for her children. And here I quote from her, rape victims may no longer be able to look after or meet the needs of their children, whether for physical reasons, long convalescence from the injury sustained or disability caused by the rape, psychological reasons, trauma, clinical depression, psychotic delirium, or cultural reasons. In some societies, rape victims are not allowed to nurse or prepare food for their children. SGBV severely interrupts a woman's or girl's ability to take care of herself and her children, especially in a context of actual or threatened famine when resources are stretched to their limits, and it becomes a life-threatening deprivation that could constitute a starvation crime. The second point I draw from our research is that SGBV directly impacts women's and girls' ability to survive mass starvation, as well as negatively shapes their life chances in the post-famine context. Our research found that for some women and girls, starvation-related vulnerabilities led to rape, sexual enslavement, forced marriage, forced pregnancy, child marriage, forced termination of pregnancies, undergoing dangerous abortions, infanticide, and the killing of their so-called undesirable children by the state or other actors. In Afghanistan, the Lake Chad Basin region, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, we've seen a dramatic rise in forced marriage of girls as families seek ways to keep themselves and their daughters alive. In addition, during conflict-caused mass starvation, women and girls must venture into areas controlled by armed forces and groups to collect wild foods and gather firewood for cooking and heating. While their knowledge of wild foods might help females survive periods of extreme deprivation, procuring those foods also exposes them to harms. Such violence results in women and girls having to make choices between searching for food and firewood and facing rape, or not venturing out to avoid rape and facing starvation of their children, older relatives, and themselves. 
This has been documented in mass starvation periods in Darfur, Northern Nigeria, Somalia, and South Sudan, among other locations. Our third finding is that flight to camps for refugees and internally displaced persons in search of food and items essential for survival during mass starvation can increase females' exposure to SGBV. In IDP or refugee camps, those in charge of camp security and resources, including national and international forces mandated to protect civilians, can use their power to require sex or forced marriage in exchange for food and other items necessary for survival as has been reported in Afghanistan, South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, and Ethiopia. Finally, the longer-term social, cultural, and economic impacts of SGBV, including disability, stigma, rejection, children born of rape, among others, often severely damages female status within their own community in the post-starvation period. This damaged status can result in long-term negative economic, social, and emotional outcomes for them and their children, sending them into deepening and often lifelong experiences of violence, poverty, and hunger. My fourth and final point is on the negative physical and mental health, social, educational, and economic costs of mass starvation on survivors, their children, and their grandchildren. And what we find is that this makes clear that a focus on mortality alone misrepresents the true toll of these crimes. The effects of surviving mass starvation last well beyond the period that ends the severe deprivation and varies for different ages, sexes, and genders. Scholars describe two patterns resulting from exposure to famine that help us understand the sex differences in long-term outcomes, and they call this culling and scarring. During famine, males' biology and social cultural behavior puts them at greater risk of death at all ages than females. The male culling effect is attributed to environmental and nutritional stressors and describes higher incidence of spontaneous abortion of weaker males, but not of weaker females, in utero. This results in fewer but more vigorous males being born. While fewer males survive, those who do often show a greater range of health advantages in their later life compared to their female cohort. The effects of mass starvation in early life are found to be more harmful over time to surviving females than males. This is due to what is referred to as scarring, in which those females who survive birth or early infancy carry with them effects that can permanently impair their health as they age. To illustrate the Great Famine of China, 1959 through 1962, provides insights into the lifelong impact of exposure to famine conditions. In the Great Famine in China, there was significant stunting in infants and children exposed to famine. Stunting is associated with underdevelopment of the brain and resulting reduced mental ability and learning aptitude, poor school performance, and increases of malnutrition-related chronic disease, including diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Prenatal exposure to famine significantly increased the risk of developing schizophrenia in both adolescence and adulthood. Females who were exposed to the famine while they were in utero or infants were more likely to miscarry and experience stillbirths as adults than women who were not exposed to famine in their early years. Compared to their male counterparts, women born during the Great Famine were more likely to be stunted, obese, illiterate, and under or unemployed having fewer years of schooling and less likely to have completed secondary school. Notably, these effects are stronger based on their mother's exposure to famine as compared to their father's. And thus we can see from these four key points that the persons responsible for famines and mass starvation are complicit in crimes whose harm is gendered and intergenerational. Thank you. Diane, thank you very much for that information. We're going to turn now to our two country case studies, and we will start with Ali, who will discuss conditions in Yemen. Thank you very much. Last month, I was in a field visit to Hodeida, to the west coast of Yemen, where I have seen how civilians were impacted by collective harm done by multiple warring parties. I have seen civilians who couldn't farm their land because their land was landminded by Ansarullah armed group and were not able to go to the sea to fish 
because they have seen too many incidents where fishermen were attacked by the Saudi UAE-led coalition. They can freely access sources of water and food because they are afraid of landmines or ground chilling. Moreover, many of them used to be teachers, public servants, and did not receive salaries since 2016. And they face inflation and high prices of elementary goods because of different warring parties imposing different customs and taxes on each good. This is an example of complicated reasons leading to starvation in Yemen. Following a long year investigations and several years of research and documentation across Yemen, Muatana for Human Rights and Global Rights Compliance published a report that documents conduct of Saudi UAE led coalition and Ansar Allah armed group uh, that has likely violated prohibitions under international humanitarian law and international human rights law. The, rep the reports provide five patterns or attacks and other conducts uh, affecting food and water security of civilians in selected areas of Yemen. The first one uh, highlights the airstrikes by the Saudi UAE led coalition on farms. The second was about attacks on water facilities. The third was on uh, attacks on boats and fishing equipment. The attacks destroyed damaged object indispensable to civilian survival, namely agricultural areas, irrigation works, livestock, fishermen, um, and preventing them from fishing at their pre-existing uh, pre capacity. The fourth and the fifth pattern where Ansar Allah imposing restrictions on humanitarian relief actions and their widespread of land mines in, in, in several um, districts. Restrictions on human rights uh, organizations, operations, and uh, diversion and redirecting of humanitarian aid to Ansar Allah loyalists affected uh, affected people in those areas and led many of the organizations uh, to end up suspending their operations in Yemen. Muatara and GRC concluded that members of the Saudi UAE-led coalition and Ansar Allah used starvation as a method of warfare. Their conduct severely impeded civilians' access to food and water and they acted in despite of the, the widespread knowledge of the dire humanitarian situation in Yemen, where people, including children, were dying from starvation. Members of the Saudi UAE led coalition and Ansar Allah were aware of the virtual certainty that following their conduct, starvation would occur in ordinary course of event, that is without humanitarian intervention or intended to use starvation as a method of warfare. Thank you. Ali, thank you very much for those firsthand of eyewitness examples. We're gonna turn now to Alex Duval who discuss Ethiopia. Thank you. So let me say a few words about the, the war in Tigray and the starvation crimes inflicted there. Tigray has two, uh, key features. First of all, it's an exceptionally severe case of widespread and systematic starvation crimes. And secondly, starvation as a weapon of war worked in its military and political objectives as uh, intended by the government of Ethiopia. So a quick note on the background, between November 2020 and November 2022, when a peace deal was signed, war was waged by the federal government of Ethiopia, the state of Eritrea and uh, militia forces from the neighboring Amhara region, not only against the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the party in power in Tigray, but also against the people of Tigray. And from a pre-war population of about 6 million, an estimated 600,000 have perished from hunger and disease during those two years. It was, prior to the war, a poor area, but an area in which there had been over 30 years of sustained effort by communities and by the government 
to protect themselves from food insecurity. It was, it was the epicenter of major famines in the 70s and 1980s, and they were vowed, and people vowed that this would never be allowed to happen again. So, um, first of all, the severity of the crimes. These unfolded in, in two phases, between November of 2020 and June of 2021, Tigray was occupied, almost all of it was occupied by the forces from the federal government, Eritrea and the neighboring regions. And during these eight months, there was destruction of and deprivation of objects indispensable to survival and ob obstruction of activities indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. There was pillage and there was looting on an enormous widespread systematic scale. Farms, were destroyed, livestock was killed or stolen, orchards were cut down, food stocks were destroyed, even um, baby chicks were crushed under the, the, uh, the boots of soldiers. There was um, ethnic cleansing of Tigrayans from the most productive areas of, of Western Tigray. Industries and services like hotels were, were ransacked um, and, and, and looted. Um, water facilities, many of them uh, provided by aid donors over the previous years, were uh, destroyed with key, um, key items um, stolen and looted. More than 80% of health facilities were rendered inoperable through destruction and looting. And there was also very widespread sexual and gender-based violence, which I won't go into because Diane has really covered that extensively. Um, the second phase was between uh, the end of June 2021 and um, November of 2022, when the Tigray resistance took over the Tigray region. And then we, what we saw was blockade and encirclement by those other forces, with uh, a complete freeze on banking, of money transfer, salaries not being paid, labor migration and trade being, being stopped, uh, fertilizer supply being prevented, and the thing that got most international attention was that humanitarian assistance trickled in at a very, very slow rate, maybe 14, 20 percent at different times of assessed need. Food and medicine was so um, cut off that even the, the major hospitals were, were ultimately forced to close because of lack of supplies, also because even doctors and nurses couldn't feed themselves. And nurses were fainting of hunger on the job. Now, what, this ma what makes this particularly tragic and instructive is that it worked. Um, because in November of, of last year, faced with mass starvation, um, the Tigrayans sued for peace. They abandoned their political agenda and essentially um, submitted to a, a very um, unfavorable terms for, for cessation of hostilities and disarmament. Um, the UN and the AU failed in their peacemaking um, obligations, which is actually a, a different story. I won't go into it here. But they failed, um, above all, in their humanitarian obligations. Uh, Resolution 2417 of the UN Security Council requires the Secretary General to report swiftly to the UN Security Council when in cases in which armed conflict might lead to widespread food insecurity. He didn't do so. There was really no substantive discussion at the UN Security Council, despite the best efforts of the government of Ireland, a non-permanent member, um, to, 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 uh, to bring the case to, to the council. And, and when there was a generic discussion of the issue, it very quickly slid off in, into the, the wider reasons for, for hunger and deprivation across the Horn of Africa, obscuring the scale and, and, and level of the starvation crimes. Um, so the, the measures that were, that, that were authorized, um, such as sanctions, even exposure, were not utilized. And there was a very effective, um, comprehensive information blackout. No international journalists were permitted to visit. The last one who was there was in June of 2021. 
And when the famine review committee that is associated with the, um, the international phase classification system of, of, of the UN made its assessment in June of 2021, it said that within three months, famine was a certainty unless there were an end to the fighting and major humanitarian aid. Neither of these were delivered and nothing more was said by the UN system about its, its lack of access um, to, to good information and, and, and therefore no famine declaration was made and no statement um, in an international forum such as the AU or the UN about starvation crimes and, and, and culpability. So whatever the merits of the war, it was the prospect of that escalating mass starvation that led directly to the Tigran decision to abandon the fight. And I find that a very disturbing conclusion. Thank you. Alex, thank you very much. We'll now turn to our final speaker, Katrina. Thank you very much and, and pleasure to hear all of you speak um, again on this and, and each time I, I learn something new. I'm going to try and end a little bit optimistically, which may seem strange in the context of what you've heard today. Um, but I want to start the next few minutes by, by actually re-quoting Alex, even though he's just spoken, uh, and taking something from his um, 2018 book, which you can see there on the slide, uh, entitled Mass Starvation. And I went back to that book um, ahead of today and the preface sets a very prescient challenge. And I want to just quote it directly because I think it will frame why there can be some positivity, um, but also to touch upon why um, and, and what is needed for the next steps. So that quote at the beginning was um, as follows. Let the legal scholars debate on how best to find a legal mechanism. The most effective route and also the quickest is well-directed public outrage. An international convention or more likely an addendum to an existing protocol or statute might be a useful focal point for mobilization. But the fundamental task is to summon sufficient universal revulsion to make it unthinkable to perpetrate famine." Uh, end quote. So debate we certainly did, and as Alex predicted, an amendment to an existing statute, as you've heard from Tom, whilst I wouldn't have said at the time was likely, was with amazing and extensive grit and determination passed unanimously in 2019. This was something that global rights compliance were part of with Switzerland. And I think, you know, it has been an instrumental focal point for mobilization. But I think, as Alex says at the end of that quote, how to summon sufficient universal revulsion remains the task in hand. And in short, in my view, one of the ways that we can continue to try and summon that is through investigations and prosecutions. So I'm going to frame my, my remaining few minutes by looking at three points. And the first is why starvation as a crime is unique, unprecedented and urgent. And then I'm going to look at um, three calls for action that global rights compliance have been regularly calling for. And third and finally, why documentation and prosecution will advance the agenda. So in terms of its uh, lack of precedent and the urgency, um, Tom, as, as ever, has very, very elegantly um, explained the evolution and, and the lack of precedent in the sense of jurisprudence and from an evolution point from the law itself. But in terms of its urgency, there is, it feels now more than ever, a really critical urgency to this issue. I was with the World Food Programme yesterday in Rome and talking with them and, and colleagues from FAO, and we're in the prospect of eight or nine famines or situations in IPC5. This is in addition to what appears to be the flagrant use of starvation tactics in Ukraine as well. Now, 2017, as Alex was writing this book that you see on the screen was dubbed the year of the four famines and it precipitated Security Council Resolution 2417, a Rome Statute Amendment and a swathe of global action and, and as you've heard, inaction. If in 2023 we are facing over double the number of those famines, urgency and preventative action must be at the forefront of these discussions. Now, in terms of why it's unique, again, this has already been very eloquently articulated and, you know, hearing from Diane and the work that 
Bridget and Kinsey, who I don't know if you can see on the screen, but um, you know the, the the detail behind that sexual and gender-based violence and that link is is a really interesting, unique subset here. But I want to just raise it in terms of its uniqueness from its causes and consequences from an accountability and investigative perspective. And there's a number of reasons why that's important. But in particular it is the range of acutely physical and psychologically painful acts, degrading acts and consequences of which you've heard from Ali and, and Diane and of course Alex. But these are often separated in time from the acts of a perpetrator and instead build slowly and cumulatively. And that has a real impact in terms of both the investigation and the prospects of a successful um, prosecution. So looking then at the three options on the, on the next slide, global rights compliance, ah, I, well, I'll come to that bit in a moment. Um, global rights compliance has typically made three broad calls for action. I think that might be one of the next slides. Well done. That's my fault for ordering it wrongly. Um, and those three actions, as you can see, have a multiple underlying options for implementation. But today, given the time constraints, I'm just going to look at um, the investigation and prosecution aspects of so the second and third points. If we go back to the previous slide in terms of investigations, you'll see some of the um, tools that we have developed over the years of, of working in this space and with the support principally of the Netherlands. And, and there we have the Starvation Training Manual, which is the, the first of its kind. We issued this in 2019. Um, there's there's nothing else like it on the market. And this year, uh, sorry, last year now, we launched the second and expanded version, which is available in Arabic and English, um, given some of our partnerships with the likes of, of Ali in, in Yemen. The new and expanded version as a tool is, is, in our view, particularly necessary and helpful. It has an expanded OSINT section and a Ukrainian language edition will be ready next month. The manual is complemented by a starvation accountability app, which you can see again on the screen there, which is essentially the manual in, in digital copy. Now, we have led several multi-year investigations into the use of starvation in Yemen, as Ali has mentioned, in South Sudan, in Tigray. We've also conducted forensic analysis into Syria, and we began this week, yesterday, in fact, with the generous support of the Netherlands, again, a two-year investigation into the use of starvation in Ukraine. And I would agree with Tom that this is a, a really important and, and highly likely um, precedent that is going to be both helpful, but I think will also raise challenges. So these investigations, um, and I think if we possibly, it might be the next slide. Um, yes, there we go. They've comprised hybrid field investigations with local partners such as Mwatana in Yemen and then in Ukraine with our local partners there to in-house OSINT um, to relying increasingly on external OSINT ex expert providers. And you can see there the Tigray report we did was with Bellingcat um, where we contracted the OSINT piece to them. And similarly in South Sudan, the report that we released in December was with the Center for Information Resilience. Now, what we've noticed through the course of those investigations from 2018 onwards has been the increase in, in starvation being reported. From the beginning when we first started, even in situations as stark as Yemen, which really was the genesis to this work in many ways, where starvation, as Ali has said, was the backbone and is the backbone to that conflict. In many of the reporting that we were seeing from a UN perspective, even the Commission of um, the Panel of Experts at the time, hunger was only mentioned in a very cursory way and, and certainly not, not at all linked to the starvation as a crime. We are now nearly five, we are five years on, and this crime is being actively featured and investigated in commissions of inquiries and their mandates which is a really positive, um, you know, and, and, and fairly rapid um, increase. That said, much more is needed and funding, of course, is key to sustainably looking into these um, pieces of work and further investigations. The panel of experts on Yemen, um, as we know, is, is no longer, uh, uh, um, the, the mandate was not renewed. There are no UN accountability initiatives looking into Yemen at the moment. There 
further investigative leads rather than trying to respond to these situations retrospectively, which of course have significant implications for evidence preservation and collection. But again, I, I would say that, you know, optimistically in the five years working in the investigative space, things have moved relatively quickly. Looking then at perp holding perpetrators uh, accountable in the, the final slide, again, Tom has talked about ratification. In December, we were three years since the anniversary of the Rome Statute being amended. Um, and as I said, Global Rights Compliance, we worked on the amendment process with Switzerland, and now we're also working with them in terms of ratification. And these are some of the products that we've produced with Switzerland and the Netherlands in terms of trying to support that. I would really agree with Tom's analysis of this evolution. And, and in my view, the legacy of the International Criminal Court and other accountability mechanisms will really be tested by both its agility and its ability to meet con current conflict patterns of criminality. There can be little doubt from the investigations and, and a small subset of investigations that we have done that there is a playbook of starvation tactics in many of the recent and current conflicts. And this usage is no doubt emboldened by the impunity with which they have been allowed to operate. And a court that is out of step, an international criminal court that is out of step with those who are victims of such conduct of hostilities risks, in my view, becoming outdated. Now, so why then is the documentation and accountability, why will it advance the agenda? Of course, this is not, you know, these are not silver bullets to remedy the harms that are suffered, but it can, in my view, serve as a really important deterrent. As Alex has said elsewhere, it will offer recognition to survivors that the indignity and shame and horror of those crimes is something that is being done to them rather than a personal failing. And that analysis through the investigations we've done time and time again has resonated with those survivors and victims. And you hear Mwatana and, and Ali and others talking about this a lot. As we've seen in the evolution of other international courts and tribunals, and indeed at the International Criminal Court, there is hope for these lesser known crimes to be elevated. But I do reiterate that the ICC's relevance and reputation will, in my view, be linked to its responsiveness on this issue of starvation. Yet, like with many other comparable evolutions, for example, the way sexual and gender-based violence is investigated and prosecuted now, I do remain quietly optimistic that with further ratifications, further advocacy, further investigations, that the ICC and national courts can be tasked with giving a voice to the voiceless. It is, in my view, only once starvation is embedded within the legal zeitgeist that we will start to see some of that revulsion that, that Alex talked about. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but thank you very much. Katrina, thank you very much. Um, we have time now for some questions and responses from our panel. I have a couple questions that I'm gonna ask and we have one excellent one already in the Q&A. And so I'd like to remind everyone um, among our participants to add their questions to the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can. I wanted to start Alex by asking you how the war in Tigray relates to broader issues of food insecurity in Ethiopia and the Horn. How do we differentiate between um, conflict related starvation and broader phenomena? Thank you. It's a it, it's a good question because the the broader issues of um, drought and uh, food crisis arising from climate change related uh, uh, stresses have been getting a lot more attention in the at least in the policy world than those arising from conflict. And within Ethiopia itself, you have four overlapping crises. You have starvation crimes in Tigray, starvation crimes in the war in Oromia, which are not re really reported upon, drought related to climate crisis, which also affects Somalia very badly, which also has its own war, um, economic crisis, including uh, massive inflation. And then we have um, other related crises in, 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 in Sudan. But there's really one core point that I want to make which is that um, drought or climate crisis related um, suffering, uh, crop failures, et cetera, 
The governments don't bear political responsibility for that. But what they do bear political responsibility for is unwinding what was previously a very effective, um, well-administered, well-financed, energetic set of crisis response mechanisms, which Ethiopia had in place until just a few years ago, um, which meant that faced with comparable national level food crises to those we have today, it was able to respond itself. And then donors then followed the lead. Now the Ethiopian government is pleading, we're a victim, there's nothing we can do about this. Well, that's nonsense because while it is a victim, it has rendered itself incapable um, of responding. Thank you. Ali, I wonder if you might respond to a question about what type of policy implications emerge from the examples that you have presented about starvation in Yemen. Um, what action- oh, Sorry, Bridget, might, hold on one second. We, we actually lost it. Ali. <laughs> sorry, oh, we lost Ali. Ali due to the internet. So oh. he's trying to come back, but maybe okay. move on and we'll we'll get this question for him. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. You. Oh, sorry. I didn't see that yeah. he'd fallen off. All right. Well, cross our fingers, right? The, the, exactly. The, the lords of the internet have pity on us. Um, let me turn then to Diane. What are the policy implications of the work that you presented? Um, how could we improve response to um, harms that are perpetrated and experienced at the intersection of sexual and gender-based violence and starvation? Well, that's a great question. Thank you, Bridget. I mean, I think one thing we need to start doing a lot better um, is to prioritize and increase kind of sex and age disaggregated, disaggregated data collection and gender analysis on the context of mass starvation and SGBV. The last five famines we've had, none have produced uh, reliable sex and age disaggregated data. So it's a question of you know what's happening to who, where, why, and when. We're we're it's just we don't have the information because we're not gathering it. So one thing is to really increase the documentation and analysis um, of what's actually happening within these contexts of mass starvation related to sex, gender, age, and SGBV. More specifically, more from the kind of humanitarian perspective, is there's really a, a need to enact these kind of post-crisis gender equitable policy provisions and interventions that promote public health policy, um, public health programming, health insurance, and care that ensures adequate nutrition for girls and women, including prenatal, maternal, and postnatal health, because we know that these um, intergenerational effects of poor health on women on the post-famine generation is going to lead to very negative uh, developmental, educational, economic, and social outcomes. And then also in terms of the, the work, in terms of um, holding people accountable, we need to really ensure gender just remedy and reparation for victims, inclu including incorporating a long-term intergenerational view of the impacts of starvation crimes and how those differ for males and females. Thank you. Great, thank you, Diane. Um, Tom, I'm gonna to turn to you next with a question that came from the um, audience. And Katrina, you may also have thoughts on this. It comes from Santiago Vargas, who um, is a visiting professional with the Office of Prosecutor at the ICC. And they ask how best to guarantee that even if um, it obtains the number of ratifications needed for its entry into force, the starvation amendment to the Rome Statute will have a preventative effect, right? So can we use it um, as a way to ward off um, starvation? And how can we ensure that the ICC will have the resources and cooperation that it needs in order to conduct investigations and prosecutions of this serious crime. So Tom, let's turn to you first. Thanks, Bridget. Um, a couple of things to say about that. So the first thing is when we're thinking about the preventive effect of international criminal law, the empirical evidence of when we see deterrence and the kind of deterrence we see suggests that one of the most significant ways in which international criminal law has an effect in terms of preventing atrocity is in the way that it stigmatizes conduct, as opposed to the cost of punishment itself, the sort of prospect of being sentenced to a particular 
duration of incarceration, it's really about the stigma. So this goes back to the point Katrina was making and quoting Alex on this issue of making this particular conduct morally abhorrent. So it's partly about emphasizing the centrality of this crime, emphasizing the degree to which it's an atrocity crime that stands with the others within the international criminal legal system, and then using that to, to draw this kind of moral outrage as itself perhaps the most important preventive mechanism. In terms of then thinking about, okay, so if we get the ratifications, how do we actually get the cooperation and resources necessary to pursue investigations? We're obviously seeing right now in the context of Ukraine that where there's the political will, resources can be devoted, we can see multi-state cooperation, collaborative investigative processes, and so on. So it's possible to do it. The question is, can we get the political will to, will to do it across other situations? And a couple of things to say about that. So this is one reason why I think a, a precedent, and Ukraine being the most obvious one, but a precedent would be important here, both because it would central it would center this particular crime and, and make it clear that this ought to be the focus of investigation and accountability but also because it would clarify for prosecutors what's actually needed to get convictions over the line in these cases i think one of the reasons why starvation tends not to have been investigated in the way that other crimes have is because we don't have that case law and therefore there's some lack of clarity among prosecutors and investigators as to what is necessary to to pursue a successful prosecution once we start to see those cases coming up then we then it can become clearer what's needed and that can itself be used to mobilize political will around accountability in other cases so it's partly about clarifying what the law is. It's partly about holding states and other actors to account and saying, look, you were willing to cooperate and engage in this provision of resources in the context of Ukraine. Here are other situations which are no less worthy of that kind of attention. And consistency demands that you devote the same kind of uh, an energy to those situations in order to pursue accountability there. Tom. Thank you. Katrina, I wanted to invite you to respond if you have anything to add to that question, but also to respond to a question that we have from our participants about investigations. And this question comes from Danielle Dammers, who asks, how can and do practitioners in the field collect evidence of starvation crimes? Are there best practices for undercovering uncovering this evidence when conducting programming and program focused research um the, the example of like needs assessments thanks Bridget and and I would just on the first point I think I, I mean I would yeah as ever I think Tom and I um pleasantly rarely disagree um which which is always a good thing I think in this context um but I think what I, I think the only thing I would add is just that I, I remember you know, when we first started out with this, especially when we started the work with Switzerland on the Rome Statute Amendment, I went into some of those negotiations with state parties thinking this was this was a no brainer, right? Like who who would actively support or at least, you know, not actively support, but would be opposed to to, you know, accountability or, you know, investigations or the prohibition of starvation generally. And I, I was you know, very naive, and I think <laughs> on reflection in that in that view, because there was a lot of long held um, reservations, concerns, some substantive, some some not. But I think what's really important, and and when I think about the way, again, as I said before, the, the evolution of sexual and gender based violence, and how those prosecutions at an international level started to trickle down, and how quickly, in fact, actually that that worked. You know, it really wasn't very long ago that you were, you know, in, in the UK, at least where I'm a practicing barrister, you were permitted to rape your wife. And that was, you know, it was a standard, you know, it, it was that was on the, the books and it was not a not an issue. And very quickly, once litigation, once accountability, once awareness happened, you start to see that trickle down effect. And we saw that with the first prosecution of where rape was held as a method of war in the International uh, Court for Tribunal, which I was also part of, not that case, but you can see the way how quickly it trickles down. And another sort of just interesting anecdote that I always sticks with me that sort of came out again in the early years of some of this work 
was I was also sort of questioning, I spent a long time from a defense perspective. So this deter question of deterrence was, was always, you know, something I was quite interested in and seeing, you know, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis in terms of, you know, a very lack of compliance with international humanitarian law. And I remember somebody, a, a colleague from the World Food Programme was discussing this negotiation he had had in, in, in an African country in terms of access into an area that they had been denied. Uh, and they were, they knew that there was a, a, you know, a severe situation within that area and they were trying to get in. And he, re he reported to me that, that one of the sort of commanders that was on that checkpoint had said to him after a very lengthy and heated and quite dangerous negotiation, the question that he asked him was, was, if I don't let you through, am I going to end up in The Hague? And I remember feeling pretty staggered that, you know, in the far flung um, you know, corners of that conflict, that that was a question. And, and I think, again, I'm ever the optimist, but it, but it did give me some hope. In terms of Danielle's question on um, uh, how do practitioners in the field collect evidence of starvation crimes, you know, it's a really great question. And I think this was one of the questions that was posed to us that precipitated the, the drafting of the starvation manual because there was no best practice guide on the market at that point. And, and this remains the only one. There's a lot of great manuals and work on, on best practice generally in investigations and documentation collection, but there just wasn't that understanding on starvation. And it was consistent because there wasn't really a lack of, you know, there's a great deal of lack of understanding from senior lawyers and, and prosecutors on what starvation looked like and what those parameters were. So we distill a lot of that best practice and apply it um, in the manual. Uh, we worked, as you, uh, as the question suggested, we worked with uh, Diane, in fact, um, who was a, a, an invaluable asset in the first round, in the first edition, and with the World Food Programme, who talked about, you know, um, looking at needs assessments, for example. The, the point I would raise about needs assessments, it would be an issue potentially of consent there. Um, and so that information, you know, may, may be sensitive if it's used for accountability initiatives. So you'd have to be a bit careful about that. But I think rather than sort of getting into some of the, the meat of this, I think one of the really interesting aspects that, and again, I think Tom mentioned this before, is that starvation as a constituent element of the crime, you don't need to demonstrate that anyone actually starved to death or indeed were hungry. Um, that's as a constituent element in terms of practice and in terms of all of the prosecutors that we've engaged with and the war crimes units, it will probably fall into, and it seems to, in my view, from those discussions, it's going to fall into a numbers game. So you will have to, from admissibility point of view, demonstrate that that harm is occurring. And so on that basis, you know, the IPC assessments that Alex mentioned and, and Dan Maxwell, again, from, from your corner of the world, you know, these are the types of things that would be really, really helpful. But there is a really nuanced way of investigating this crime. And, and my final point, so we've taken a long time to answer it, but just very quickly, is there's a really, really important gender component, as, as Diane and, and Bridget, as you know, and Kinsey, but that really translates into how to do a starvation investigation with a gender-informed um, approach. And, and that's just... Again, it's in the manual, but it, it's critical that that is considered. Sorry, that was really long. <laughs> All right, Katrina, thank you for that response. Um, we have two more excellent questions in the Q&A, but I apologize. We have gotten to the end of the time that we have reserved for this morning's or afternoon, depending on where you are, um, for our program. Um, so we're going to have to start concluding. Um, in the first instance, we want to thank everyone for joining us. And we'd like to invite you all to continue this conversation in your own communities. Um, as we noted at the beginning, this is part of the work of changing the priority that we place on starvation um, and, and changing how we create policy to mitigate its impact. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to our colleagues, Anne Rade and Kinsey Spears at the Feinstein International Center um, for really making today's uh, webinar possible. We'd also like to thank our expert panelists who have presented examples of the acute suffering produced by starvation crimes and for showing us that there is ample law sort of 
on the books um, and starvation crimes can be monitored, they can be investigated and theoretically they can be prosecuted. And over the last few years, we have also seen that this possibility is maybe coming closer to realization, but there is significant work left to do and some serious unanswered questions um, about international leaders' willingness to invoke the law and what a prosecution, even if it would take place, might achieve. In the first instance, international response to recent incidences of starvation crimes in Tigray, Yemen, and Ukraine, all of which took place or are taking place while the law is theoretically advancing, raises serious questions. As ever, in cases of international law, there's this enormous gray area, what we often refer to as political will uh, to take action. And the most troubling examples, some of which we've heard today, gray would be generous. Um, aside from possibly South Sudan and Ukraine, where prosecutions may be difficult, um, but there seems to be a strong appetite for impunity. Nonetheless, if official action is wanting, this actually increases the responsibility of civil society actors to continue to push. When we continue to hold these discussions, to remain steadfast in our refusal to accept mass starvation as mere background noise, and to shine light on the gaps between law and what is tolerated by our leaders, we make the law relevant, even if imperfectly so. So I'd like to take the time to thank you all for participating and wish you the best of the rest of the day and as you continue your work on um, this and other important topics. So thank you all for joining us. We will make the link available to you if you'd like to share this uh, webinar with others. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for moderating as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.